All right, everyone. Welcome uh, to a wonderfully populated uh, Esoterica live stream with some amazing people. Well, one of them is probably maybe not a person, um, <laughs> but who knows? But uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome uh, Zevi from Seekers of Unity, uh, Dan from the Modern Hermeticist, uh, Angela from Angela Symposium, and our neighborhood friendly ghoul, who I think may be representing. <laughs> Let's talk religion. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks Hi. for having us. Yeah, Hello. happy Halloween. Happy Sawan. Um, yeah, happy Sawan for those celebrating, the pagans and Wiccans and magic practitioners that celebrate it. Yeah, all of the, all of the real people, the real, the real cele celebrators of, of Halloween. Um, so, I, like I said, we were talking about this beforehand, and I don't have a, a you know much of a, an agenda or anything. Just feel like like at some level, all of our channels have touched on this uh, this holiday to some degree. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, riding the wave of spooky season is just like part and parcel of how you know at least the channel operates. You know, and, um, Philip, assuming that Philip is even there, uh, you know, dedicates a whole <laughs> a whole month to it. Um, and around Esoterica and, you know, around uh, us, Angela, I think it's just kind of always Halloween, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and certainly Dan is Halloween adjacent and uh, Zevi's along for the ride. But um, <laughs> um, Halloween but I, adjacent. Halloween adjacent. <laughs> um, but I guess what I was going to wonder, and I just kind of get all of your uh, your thoughts on this and um yeah, you know, what 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 is it that you think attracts people to this holiday? What I mean, it isn't a it is an interesting success story of a holiday where it goes from being basically a holiday of a persecuted minority, Irish people, uh, in the United States mostly. It goes from that kind of holiday, basically beginning in the late nineteenth century, at least in America, and uh, has exploded into a what multi billion dollar, you know. Industry. I mean, Halloween. I would say that, uh, right? You know, with the exception of Christmas, probably as like an industrial machine, Halloween probably generates uh, more finances and more stuff than uh, I mean, the amount of material made for Halloween is amazing. Like the uh, the amount of like inflatable things in my neighborhood, of like inflatable Home Depot sized two story ghosts, um, which I'm you know all about. Uh, but what do you think? What do you think has caused this holiday to to rocket to its, uh, I mean, international prestige and international acclaim? Um, yeah, I think you, that... looking at you, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you could be looking at me. <laughs> so I think that there might be many reasons as to why this holiday has got such a um, popularity. But obviously, for pagans, it is something that has a deep religious meaning and we can go into that but i think more generally this is the time of the year where everybody is allowed to be weird and um even though i think that there are some people that have a more a wider and uh, deeper interest in the occult and in esoteric matters, probably those who follow our channels. Um, but I think that more generally, I'd say that most people tend to have that kind of itch that they'd like to scratch at one point in some way when it comes to what is occult and or what is hidden. So I'd say that um, Samhain or Halloween is about everything that is hidden and is in a way, on the other side, on the other side of what is conventional. So it allows you to be unconventional. And for one day or a few days, that's considered acceptable. And uh, on the other side of what is visible, because it is um, a festivity that has to do with, with the occult and, and magic and witchcraft. And also on the other side of life, because it has to do with afterlife and the, the world of the dead and uh, interacting with ancestors. So I'd say that, uh, you know, probably one of the reasons as to why it's, it's so popular is that it allows us to explore safely, safely meaning uh, you know, during a time where it's considered acceptable, that other side, that everybody in one way or another is, you know, um, 
feels the the allure and uh, you know for some people it's just about watching horror movies to to scratch that itch for other people it is to explore uh, witchcraft and historic topics or even learn about them but uh, i don't know I, I think my impression is that most people tend to have some kind of attraction towards um everything that is hidden unexplainable occult mysterious and on the other side of what is uh, commonly available to us i totally agree i think that um darkness is obviously a part of life and a part of the world and and something that like you said angela it, it's alluring to a lot of people in, in in many ways and i think this season um is, is a is a is an opportunity for us to to talk about that stuff to talk about death for example which is a very important and significant part of everyone's lives or non-lives i guess um and so halloween and, and just this season in general uh, becomes an opportunity for us to 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 explore something that in other times of the year kind of it's not that it isn't allowed to be talked about but it's we often sort of turn our backs on those topics because it's uncomfortable but uh, there is an itch like you said Angela there's an itch to to explore that and to to embrace that aspect of the world too and I think that to me at least that's one of the reasons why I find this season so interesting and so so valuable on a personal level is that it allows one to to do that can i um say something uh justin uh, that has to do with my channel it's just that since we are talking about the afterlife and these kind of things in a few hours i will have a live stream with a scholar who specializes on near-death experiences so in case people are interested uh please go over on Andrea's symposium and so that you can get notified when in a few hours i go live yeah and also just if you're not subscribed to all these people that are here <laughs> you should go do that because they're all fantastic uh fantastic uh, channels. Um, Zevi, I want to kick it over to you because I think that, you know, like the same question, like Judaism, for instance, our religion doesn't have an analog at all to, to this. I mean, we have dress up holidays and things like that, but uh, you know, wondering, you know, to what degree, like you, you also having grown up in the, the very Orthodox world, how you sort of relate to this holiday and what you think about it and why you think it's popular because it, in many ways it's, uh, at least for me as an American Jew, I, I see Halloween around me. I really like the holiday, but there's even in American Judaism, there's a real debate about to what degree we should even be celebrating it. Yeah. Um, right. And it's, um, you know, I've even definitely have friends of mine who are Orthodox or conservadox and absolutely, absolutely not. Uh, it's not on their agenda, but I just wonder if you had any thoughts uh, on, on that, on those intersections and those relationships. Yeah, it is interesting to come at it as an outsider. And I think it's not just the Jewish community that are outsiders. I know a lot of my Protestant friends who will not celebrate Halloween on principle, religiously. Um, so, And it's interesting to be in a dominant culture where Halloween becomes part, just part and parcel of the consumerist like world that we live in. Um, I think, I think I was thinking about what might be, we were chatting earlier this week about what might be the Jewish parallel or comparison to... Halloween and there are certainly elements of it that are found we have dressing up in Purim and we have you know a bit of darkness and morbidity around Tishba and Yom Kippur we have bonfires for those that are a bit more traditional in their celebrations on Lagba Omer but I think perhaps one of the reasons why Halloween may be so popular besides for obviously the reasons that have been mentioned here is because it really is about exploring these liminalities. It's a place where, as Angela said, the, the veil is thinnest between life and death. And I think that there's another liminality that perhaps Halloween allows us to, to explore in a very light way, perhaps for those that are doing it in a light way or, or more seriously, for those that are doing it more seriously. And that is the, the space between childhood and adulthood. I think there's like a lot of the crisis of modernity that we don't have ways like we had in tra more traditional societies where someone would go through a ritual and process to become an adult, something which has been studied very thoroughly by scholars of religion like Merchaliade and others of these of these very significant transitory uh, rituals. In Judaism, we have things like the bar and bat mitzvah, which may be a bit too young to become an adult at 12 or 13, but that's where the Jewish tradition pins that. And I think that 
perhaps, and I'd be curious to hear what, what, what you here think, that this capacity to, to dress up and to put on a character and to play around um, in, in sort of the more popular way that it's done today um, is something about embracing the, the difficulty of maturing into adulthood and the anxiety that comes with that with responsibility and wanting to remain a child and for at least one day to be able to still be childlike um, and for children then to dress up in, in costumes of something that, you know, approaches, you know, end of life and adulthood and death is the ultimate form of, of adulthood, one could say. Um, and, and maybe there's something of, an, of a contemporary liminality being explored there, which is, and maybe its popularity is precisely because we don't have, at least in the West, dominant forms of commemorating and marking the transition from childhood to adulthood. Yeah, I think that's a great, yeah, again, uh, and I think Angela pointed this out too, right? The the liminality of Halloween, I think, is exactly uh, part of what makes it so attractive in, in that way. Mm -hmm. Dan, you may be representing more the, the, the a Christian perspective more than uh, other folks on the, the panel, if I can, if I could say that, but um, what do you think? Where, where's your, where do you land on this question about what drives, what's the driving force behind the popularity of the holiday? So I'm definitely pro Halloween, so I should put that out. Um, I think that it it plays into our. So in order to understand something, you need to smash it apart um, and pick up the pieces and put it back together. And I think that Halloween, in a way, and all those previous festivals that are similar to it, like the opening of the wine casks or maybe Saturnalia or things like that, they are holidays that. Um, they are a Saturnalian inversion of categories. And I think in order to understand the categories that make up society, we need to basically smash them and then come back and put the pieces back together. And I think what we do is we allow on Halloween a lot of the, um, I don't know if you want to call it the Apollonian, the orderly, the, um, the civilizational, all of these kind of restrictive impulses we allow ourselves to loosen those and embrace a kind of Dionysian uh, ecstasy or enthusiasm where you are uh, permitted to let out all of the weird stuff that normally you have to hide away in order to function in society because society is, is built on these structures of repression. I think of Euripides' Bacchae as a really good example of King Pentheus trying to resist Dionysus and trying to resist this ecstatic impulse or this impulse to um, bend categories, and it destroys him. And so there's a deeply ingrained thing in, in I don't know, Western culture, if you want to call it that, to play and flirt with these boundaries and um, to let the weird out because it allows us to be normal again afterwards. Uh, and I think that's a really important part that people miss out. And the reason why it's so firmly delineated is because our world is weird enough as it is. It's dark enough as it is. There's enough death and, and spooky stuff going around at all times. Um, but this allows us to play with it in a way that is not so serious. And I think that that's also important to, um, to interact with these themes but kind of defang them in a way or make them a little less um, encroaching. Because, you know, if your life is surrounded by death and chaos and darkness, you're probably not going to want to celebrate it too much. But uh, luckily, uh, our, our civilization, uh, maybe not luckily, it's, it's a double-edged sword. They sweep these things under the rug, and, uh, and it's important to view these things from a different angle. Uh, I'm reminded of a quote by... William Blake from The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And he says, the reason Milton, John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, wrote in fetters when he wrote of the angels and God and at liberty when he wrote of the devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. And so this is, this is a very, um, you know, it goes back. 200 years goes back further than that this impulse toward the weird toward the devilish towards uh everything that is opposite of what we consider to be good and constructive mm -hmm. um and so i think 
Halloween is a time that we allow ourselves to uh, interact with those things without that that darkness overwhelming us. Yeah, I, I the the thing about this is the I use the example of a sort of a steam valve. That Halloween is an example is an ability to let off the steam of those things in a way that is basically denatured, right? It's not it's not inherently uh, unsafe, and <clears throat> also the the uh, you know, I, we, we took our family to the big historic graveyard here over the weekend. That's really, really beautiful. And, and, uh, and it was an opportunity for me to take my four-year-old, right. Who's you know, somewhere on the spectrum probably, and begin to have first conversations around death and talking about what dead people are and what death is and what happens when you die and sort of mm -hmm. begin polling them about what they think death is. And, you know, just contemplating like the fact that there are literally hundreds of people beneath you and are with you and you know what is this place the graveyard and what is death and dying um so those are really great again ability to to do it in a jovial beautiful way the graveyard's in the middle of fall and it's incredibly beautiful and things like that um so yeah i like this idea that it's a way of interacting with these otherwise quite terrifying uh things via the festival the festival is the mechanism that mediates it and this is a very how bataille i think would think about this uh this interaction of the festival and the mediation with these very powerful forces that we can't interact with directly. I mean, they're terrifying and they'll destroy us. So we interact with them, we interact with them in a very carefully curated way via the festival or scary movies or trick-or-treating or, or, or what have you, uh, or ritual practice, right? Where it's available to you in some sense one, one, day, uh, one day a year. I think another thing that I think is really interesting about Halloween is that it's really interesting to see a, hol a holiday that's gotten like escape velocity from religion. Mm -hmm. Like I like the idea of a hol like a holiday that's sort of like gotten away from religion at some level. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that what's interesting about Halloween in that regard is that because it's achieves escape velocity from the strictures of religion, it's become a very protean holiday. And one of the really interesting things that one can do, uh, and I was talking about this on a podcast I was on, is look at how Halloween was celebrated in the early 20th century and the late 19th century and look, compare it to how it's celebrated now, and they're very unsimilar. Um, mm -hmm. Like, if you took up one of these copies of what are called the bogey books, uh, these are like, basically, have folks ever seen these or read these before? I don't think no. so, no. The bogey books are basically early 20th century how-to-do Halloween books. They're like, here are games, and here are fun activities, and here's how to gaze into a mirror to find your future lover, and here's how to, you know, blah, 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 blah. So there are these books, like how to, it's basically like, uh, I don't know, Hilchot Halloween, uh, Zevi would like, it's sort of like how to do Halloween. And what's really fascinating about it is that so much about early 20th century Halloween stuff was about having like fun. It was a really fun oriented. And also mm -hmm. a huge component of it was also uh, a socially acceptable way for boys and girls, especially boys and girls coming in out of childhood into adulthood. And this is to Zevi's point, to interact for the first mm -hmm. time. And to become flirtatious and like how to flirt in a way where you can, you know, it's not like the spin the bottle kind of flirtation stuff, but something like that. And so these, again, this is another place where these adolescent sexual urges could also be unleashed in the context of the festival. And I think that's also a big part of what goes on now in Halloween is also you have this big libidinal aspect of it as well, mm -hmm. um, more to the point of Bataille. But I love comparing how protein the holiday is. That in the 1980s, it had this, I think, genuinely scary stranger danger. What do we do with this holiday with the satanic panic stuff? In the 2000s, it became a bit more uh, fun. Like it, it was a bit more fun. And in the early 20th century, it had this very different aspect to it. So I, I don't know. I, I really what I, I like about the holiday is because it's gotten this escape velocity, it's not condemned to be anything. It, it has a it has a sort of field that it uh, that it vibrates in and. Uh, depending on where the social milieu is uh, and where our fears, anxieties, where we want to have fun, where we want to transgress, where the liminalities are, Halloween allows us, uh, it, it gives us a platform by which to invent and reinvent it in a way um, that um, that makes it engaging in a way that if it were simply reserved for All Hallows' Eve and it was basically a special mass you know, for all saints, I think it would have become like it basically is now, a relegated boring holiday in the catholic tradition um 
but it's precisely because of its escape velocity from religion at some level uh, that it's escaped from Catholicism at some level, but also it's been able to be reclaimed by the pagan and the occult communities as a as a reconstituted, reconstructed religious holiday of neo Sawan, which I think is a really fascinating cultural thing. And Angela could say more about that than I ever could. But I don't know. Those are some of the ideas that I think of when I think of why I uh, I find it to be to be interesting. But yeah, if you guys have never looked at the bogey books, um, they're really, really worth looking at. There's a YouTuber I really love named Kaz Rowe, and uh, they take some bogey books and uh, recreate some of the the some of the things that one can do at these uh, early 20th century Halloween parties. And uh, they're still kind of fun uh, and silly in a way. Ah. Oh, Philip. <laughs> oh, the unveiling. It the is you. <laughs> The veil was too thick. It's like the end of the Scooby Doo. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have gotten no, love... away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids. <laughs> I love that point that you're saying, Justin, that so long as the festival, and the festival is such an important space culturally, societally, for something to be expressed that needs to be expressed, so long as it would have been stuck within specific, you know, you know boundaries and borders and delineations of of a given tradition it wouldn't have the flexibility to take on the need to express whatever expresses in the moment um, and because pr particularly because it's as you've put it escaped the the orbit of catholicism then it's able to in each generation adapt to whatever it is that needs that pressure released off it in a fun and, and creative way and i think that you see that even with some other larger traditions i think the way that Purim here is celebrated in Israel. Um, it's just, a huge, I think, tons of people exploring their sexuality, exploring their identity, exploring relationships, all kinds of things are being done under the veil of a literal mosque and often some alcohol. Um, and and part of I think that's part of the masking here, right? Uh, and part of this tradition of it's like, and, 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 and in a way you can therefore study whatever is being done in a predominant way on Halloween and, and, and learn therefore about the society, about what is it that's needing to be Halloweened off once a year. Right. By wearing the mask, you tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I think something <laughs> that uh, is important about Halloween that doesn't really exist as much in other holidays or it does, but in a more firmly delineated kind of way is exploring creativity and imagination. You, there's a more individualistic element of Halloween where, you know, with Christmas or with Easter or with these sorts of things, those rituals are more prescribed clearly. Um, you know, you bring in the tree, you put the ornaments on the tree, you have uh, certain types of foods that you eat. Everything is more patterned, whereas Halloween encourages you to do something different every year and to do something that speaks of your personality and in a way that's very different from a lot of festivals which are more about reaffirming certain cultural values or reaffirming certain cultural um patterns and i think that halloween breaks with that that is the essence of halloween essentially is is breaking with these patterns uh while being in a very controlled environment mm -hmm. and i think that that's something probably why it has seeped out of as you say the orbit of religion and launched into the secular world or or what have you because there is um, a more freedom and more allowance for personal uh, uh for your personality and imagination and individuality to shine forth and i think that obviously those are values that secular society has um and they're, they're you know they're good values but they're they're things that you wouldn't necessarily expect in a religious uh ceremony that is usually based on affirming patterns and affirming uh similarities between individuals instead of expressing differences yeah i think one of my favorite uh, halloween uh rules was I, I got to go to a party where no one was allowed to buy a costume mm -hmm. like you had to make one and oh, the, cool. the bogey books also have lots of costume ideas which are again mm -hmm. like especially the ones from the twenties are really creative as you can imagine. Um, but again, that creative, uh, aspect is, is I think important, uh, Angela from the, from the neo-pagan like, uh, world and that the world that's sort of reconstructing, um, 
could you maybe share something about maybe how the holiday has changed over the course of maybe, maybe the past hundred and so years about, is there something that you can think of like how the observance of Sawan as a religious holiday in the neo-pagan world, has that been something that's also been evolving and changing over the past century or so that that process has been ongoing? Yeah. So first of all, um, pagan study scholars prefer to say contemporary paganism as opposed, as opposed to neo-paganism or using the term neo because um, it's often found to be derogatory by practitioners and in some cases it's not even that informative. So I will use contemporary paganism instead. So yeah, the contemporary pagans have started to um, uh, to uh, celebrate uh, Samhain uh, ever since, you know, Wicca, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say that over the past almost a century, not yet, but almost, uh, it has evolved. And the way it has evolved, I think, is, well, first of all, it went, you know, it, it got detached from traditional Wicca, the Gardnerian and Alexandrian Wicca traditions. But also uh, what I noticed is that there are also magic practitioners that would not specifically identify as pagans that also incorporate uh, Samhain. And in some cases, they also incorporate the other uh, seven Sabbaths of the Wheel of the Year that has been systematized in that way by the Wiccan tradition. But there are also those who would practice specifically Samhain and not the other ones. So it's like it, it seems to be the Sabbath among all of the eight that have been uh, brought uh, about by, by Wicca or systematized by Wicca that uh, has got more popularity among magic practitioners even those who are not pagans or do not identify as pagans um, and I think that that is because it is strongly associated with witchcraft and the idea of the the veil between the words getting uh, thinner basically allowed for allows for magic practitioners or those who are interested in witchcraft and magic to practice more so for instance some practices that uh, people do now are divination practices as you said to find out the um, the name of uh, of your lover that, that was actually part of the tradition but now it's more generally using divination because the idea is that if the veil between the words is at its thinnest then it's easier to sort of speak through and understand what's um you know what's in front of you in terms of your future so lots of pagans do divination during this time of the year uh, with tarot cards or other forms of divination and um also rituals rituals to reconnect with the ancestors or rituals to abandon things in their lives so it is a time where pagans and magic practitioners they associate this time with uh, leaving behind stuff because it is the you know the beginning of the the end and the beginning of the Celtic uh, year um, and so uh, and it has become the new year for pagans too and in some cases as I said for magic practitioners who don't identify as pagans but they incorporated a lot of elements uh, from paganism so it's the new year for pagans and over time ever since Wicca um, popularized this uh, this festival uh, pagans still still see that as the as the new year and um, as opposed to the the first of January that is the secular new year but the first of November is the witchy new year you know the the pagan new year. And so that means that uh, there are some practices that would be associated with the with the with New Year's Eve that might also be incorporated in the practice of sewing, um, and the the idea of thinking about what you're going to do for the next turn of the wheel and the, you know the next wheel of the year. And uh, what else? Um, are there any contemporary pagans that disavow Samhain? What do you mean? Who like who are like anti Halloween? Not that I know of. <laughs> I think the those would be the people I don't want to talk to because those would be the true weirdos. Those are the true. <laughs> tr those are the truly transgressive uh, uh, people who are like, no, we're not doing. We're not doing. Uh, I've Halloween not. Halloween. Yeah, I've known pagans who were against like Beltane. <laughs> that was kind of in a in a semi comedic way because. Um, 
uh, in Italy, there are several pagan groups and uh, they celebrate um, the eight Sabbaths. And there tends to be an emphasis on the sexual elements because there are some people that would argue that contemporary paganism is a fertility type religion or adjacent to that. And so there is um, that kind of strong sexual association even in the rituals. And not, I'm, I'm not saying that public rituals in, involve some kind of sex, but there is a lot of sexual symbology. And that probably you know, also draws back from uh, some ceremonial pra practices and uh, Crowley. Crowley definitely had some, played some influence, played some role in the shaping of Wicca. I, I do have a video on that. But um, yeah, so for instance, for those pagans that are not that fond of, you know, the, the, the sexual elements, they would say, oh, no, I don't want that saying, let's just skip it because it's too, too much about sex. <laughs> I, there, there was one pagan that I knew that said that. But as for Samhain, I don't think I've ever come across any, <laughs> any pagan who was not fond of it, to be fair. Um, I think that it's kind of, it's often considered the, the uber sabbat you know the, the most important one and the one that uh, pagans tend to um be more enthusiastic about yeah that i mean that that seems to logically follow i just always i'm always curious about where there are interesting exceptions to rules because i feel like a big part of of alter of of a big part of some of some elements of these religions of rejecting some things and i can imagine like someone being like no we're we're absolutely not then I'm trying to think of a a, a neo constructivist, uh, an, a kind of new constructivist paganism that would reject it. Like, I don't know, maybe like the, yeah, I wonder what the relationship is with like Native American religions and Halloween because of the colonial stuff, or or even like Jewish witches, folks who uh, cohen people. I don't know. I don't know. Well, the, the one thing I'm not sure that's probably unrelated, actually, but I was thinking that, uh, for instance, in uh, in Italy, uh, earlier, earlier you were talking about how Halloween is somewhat got detached from religion or, you know, um, with the exception of uh, pagans and there are other exceptions. But for instance, in, in Italy, since Italy is still a, a strongly Catholic country, every time that uh, Halloween is approaching, there are lots of campaigns from you know, Catholics or priests that are sort of trying to um, tell people to not celebrate Halloween because uh, it is actually a devil worship kind of uh, celebration. And uh, so there is still that strong element in, in Italy. So I would imagine that if there, if there are, for instance, Christian witches, maybe they might have a problem with it, but I, I don't think that I've ever come across Christian witches that had a problem with Samhain, to be fair. Uh, because I think that if you are a witch and you are also Christian, you pr are probably not the most dogmatic and the most traditional one. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, celebrating uh, Samhain would be a problem for you. And since it is considered like the witchy, you know, the, 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 how can we say it's the most witchy the most, the most witchy kind of celebration i i find it difficult to imagine um how somebody who pract who's a practitioner might be against it but there might be people out there so if there are any you know just leave us a comment or I'd be curious. let us know i mean i could also easily imagine and i, I don't think this would happen but someone who also who identifies as a witch, but really wants to move beyond historical associations with how witch hunters conceived of witchcraft, because obviously the concept, the way that the inheritance of we most of what we think of as witchcraft was like horrifying delusions of inquisitors. And so I can imagine someone being like, in the same way that I wouldn't want to play into like hooked nose money lending Jews as a way of like being Jewish. Uh, I wouldn't want to play into a bunch of like horrifying anti-Semitic stereotypes that were invented by people who wanted to hurt us. I can also imagine just rejecting uh, out of hand a lot of uh, the idea, of even like the Sabbath, right? Which was an idea, first it had its origins in anti-Semitism, uh, the idea that witches go to a Sabbath like the Jews do. Uh, and also the idea of flight and everything else is like so wrapped up in the demonological stuff of the Middle Ages that I can easily imagine someone being like, yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with 
the delusion, the dement, the demented dream, fever dreams of inquisitors, um, and really moving as far beyond that as as um, as visually possible, because there's so much. Again, the image of the witch is wrapped up also in anti-Semitism with the the crazy black hair and the hook nose and and all that stuff. It's like that image is heavily influenced by depictions of Jews in the Middle Ages. So I don't know. I I wonder like to what degree there's both a relationship with the past and the inheritance of the past, but also looking at it and going like, yeah, I don't want to have anything to do with the elaborated theory of witchcraft. Like that was a delusional conspiracy theory. They got 60,000 women killed like full stop. No, I don't know. I just, I can, I can imagine it cutting in two ways in that way. Um, yeah. I think that usually contemporary practitioners tend to reclaim that, you know, to there is more of a, an acknowledgement of what happened in the past and um, uh, all those negative attributions that got associated with witchcraft and reclamation and sort of reappropriation of those terms. Uh, I think that it doesn't happen only with witchcraft. It happens often even with terms that um, began as derogatory terms and then over time you know, th those people start to reclaim those terms and reappropriate them and give them a different meaning. I think it is an in-group way of changing the discourse around not only the term, but also how society views that specific thing, you know, that specific class of people. So I think that also happened with uh, pagans and magic practitioners. Obviously, you know, pagan he was born as a derogatory term and um the same goes for uh witch and um magic even uh magic yeah maybe magic was also a derogatory term definitely not a positive term goiteia was much worse than magaya but still if if you guys were to have a day off for halloween would you want to have the day of halloween off or the day after halloween off Day after. Okay. Day after, yes. <laughs> so you would work you would go to work October 31st, but then you wouldn't have to go to work November 1st. Yeah, it makes sense because technically, you know, Samhain would be from the dusk of the 31st to the dusk of the 1st. So that would allow you to actually celebrate the the festivity. I'm talking more about Samhain than Halloween, obviously, but <laughs> that's my contribution to the panel. Yeah, I mean, I guess I tend to think of it as like, is, is it Halloween now? I don't know, like ish. It's like air, it's like air of Halloween. And then you have Halloween starts at sundown and goes, um, I don't know. Uh, Philip, how has how Halloween performed and done in your experience in, in Scandinavia? Um, and, and Parties parties is it and, and do you know how old the importation of halloween is into into scandinavia or how how does it get how does it how does halloween go down and among the norse that's a good question i think i could be wrong but i've heard that it came over here primarily in the 80s and thereabouts uh at least the american sort of version of, of halloween we have uh all saints day uh which is really All Souls Day, which is celebrated. Well, here it's celebrated on the first weekend of November. So it, it usually falls right after Halloween. And the two holidays are kind of, uh, when I grew up, so like 20 years ago, the two holidays were often intertwined and, and confused. I mean, my parents didn't really get what, what the difference was, like what's Halloween. They thought that that was the same as All Saints Day. I think since then, uh, Halloween as a, as a standalone thing has become a lot more common, at least in my experience. Uh, and so it's very, the way Halloween is celebrated is very, very sort of Americanized. We watch horror movies, we, we get, you know, get dressed up, we'd go trick or treating. We, uh, yeah, like I said, we go to parties and drink alcohol. I don't, of course, but pe people tend to, uh, and then, and then all saints day slash all souls day will fall the next weekend or whatever. And uh, for those days, we go to the cemetery. So this is probably why it's so closely related because it's similar themes, death and, and, and all this. We go to, to the cemetery to, to remember the people we have lost and all the dead. We don't really 
well, I say we, but in general, Swedes, we don't really care about the saints, which is why I say that it's really all souls day, because what people do is they commemorate their lost uh, or their, their, uh, their relatives that have passed away recently and so on. Um, so it can be a little confusing. I think, like I said, I think Halloween is relatively recent uh, in the last 50 years, at least it, it's, it's come over here. And Zevi, is there any in 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 uh, in, I, in in IP? Is there any? Do you see much in the way of uh, Halloween going down around you? Yeah. So I think there's two things going on here. There's firstly the same Americanization that happens in Norway happens here, um, and that's certainly more the case in Tel Aviv, where there's going to be full blown, right. you know, block size party Tel Aviv ragers all night for Halloween, and um, and that's definitely going to go down. Jerusalem, there's probably going to be less of that just because Jerusalem is more of a conservative and generally religious city compared. Um, but still, there's like like private parties, friends of mine, uh, secular friends are throwing, you know, Halloween costume parties and then like the hostels throwing parties for tourists here. I know that's a thing as well that happens quite religiously. Um, but then on the more serious side of things, November 1st, All Saints Day here, there's definitely going to be a lot of worship happening, a lot of um, you know, people heading up to whether it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Notre Dame Center here or Domitian Abbey. Um, and so there's, I think there's both like the solemn, serious Catholic way of doing it. And then this, the general American uh, get drunk, party up, wear less clothing going to be happening. So whichever, which, which, whichever one you're in for, we have, we have it all. Some, so somehow trick the, or treating. Oh yeah. Like, is there like for all of you, uh, in Sweden and in Italy, what's the what's the uh, protocols on trick or treating? And this is all? actually a part of a larger question I want to ask uh, all the, the panel: is that what what does one have to do? And this is it shows you my incredibly like Jewish mind when thinking about holidays. Like, what does one have to do to have accomplished Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would I was just thinking about, that, <laughs> I was thinking about what would happen if Halloween was celebrated by the Jews, like. All of the halakha, like all of the laws, like exactly. if you only gave one candy, you were you yep. fulfilled your obligation? Exactly, you have to take the, the, the pumpkin and you, you know it has that pitom and <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is like you can see the way that uh, Zevi and I are like the halakhic Jewish legal way of like how what is the minimum must must one have done to, in order to you know do you have to watch uh, at least half of a horror movie? Right, right, right. Uh, is it only for the children? Is it before midnight? Does after midnight yeah. count? <laughs> Kosher pumpkins. <laughs> yeah, like you know, if uh, uh, do you have to eat a certain amount of candy before you know? Um, but yeah, so the trick or treating question, but also um, for folks, what is what is it? What is uh, what does a successful Halloween uh, or, or Sawan look like for 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 y'all? But to Dan's hello, uh, trick or treating question, I'm just curious how that looks in other, in other. Uh, and Angela has two two countries that she can speak from. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> now that I'm in the UK, so in Italy, I think that the um, uh, Halloween was awkwardly incorporated, you know, from the Americans. I'd say after the not right after the 1950s, but I would argue that Italy has been very much influenced by the American culture ever since the Second World War. So um, yeah, because of what happened in the Second World War, I would argue that lots of people actually argue that Italy has been slowly kind of, I wouldn't say culturally colonized because that's too heavy of a term, but definitely the American culture has played a significant influence on the Italian culture. And there's, you know, the, this idea, especially in the 80s and the 90s, that America was this, you know, very wealthy place. And we also have an expression in Italian, the uncle from America, when somebody is rich and wealthy and they are generous, you know, there's this kind of association, or there used to be, especially in the past. And I think that uh, since a lot of American TV shows, and I also realized by moving in the UK, how much of an American influence there is even on Italian television, as opposed to an influence from the UK. And even when it comes to paganism, and th this is this blows my mind, because, you know, England is much closer to Italy than the US is. But um, paganism came to Italy from the US, not from the UK. And the type of Wicca, 
that got incorporated and uh, Italian pagans started to practice was the US version of Wicca, not the English version, which is quite kind of surprising. And then over time, of course, that has been challenged and you have like more educated pagans that you know, started to uh, unpack why that is and uh, the different types of Wicca and so on. But uh, yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> digressing. Uh, but yeah, I'd say that Halloween got incorporated because of American TV shows. Um, and uh, and because, you know, especially those who grew up in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s, since there was such a massive presence of American TV shows and watching all the episodes on Halloween, uh, people just started to want to celebrate too. Because when you watch something over and over that starts to, inf- to, to have an influence on you, you start to feel like you should be celebrating that as well. And uh, I think that's that's why it slowly got into the culture. It was kind of a slow process, and I'd say that only the people only started to celebrate Halloween relatively recently, probably after the two thousands. Um, but yeah, the trick of trading is even more recent. I don't think that it was happening at all, you know, ten years ago. Um, now there are some kids go around and do the trick or treat uh, in Italy as well, but I wouldn't say that it is a massive thing yet because there is a lot of pushback from the Catholic Church and from Catholics. So I'd say that it is a thing, and it is probably more celebrated by adults, you know, doing parties and. Um, you know, uh, have wearing masks and less clothes, as Zavi said, um, <laughs> as opposed to children. I think that it is something that he is becoming a thing for children too, but I wouldn't say that it is this massive thing going on. And it is a bit similar in the UK, although this uh, here in the UK is a bit more celebrated in terms of trick or treating as opposed to Italy. Um, and here, yeah, you have that uh, kids would knock on the door, but they, you know, English people are very polite, so they wouldn't knock at your door unless you have some kind of Halloween decoration outside of your door. So they are kind of polite. So if you if you want to have kids knocking at your door, I'm not sure if in the US it's the same, but here uh, it's kind of a signifier that uh, kids can knock on your door uh, because you are you know, willing to, to play along. Um, yeah, here it's your porch light. You turn your porch light on to indicate that you, that you want, uh, you, you want trick or treaters. I don't know how it is oh. in Canada. Yeah, Same thing. Here in the, here in the UK, and, they have decorations. Yeah. If you don't want them, you turn all your lights off and you yeah. go and watch TV in the basement or something. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you do then? No, this year, (laughs) sometimes, sometimes it really depends. Like the last three years, you didn't really want people coming up to your house and, and, uh, giving you COVID or whatever. So there was, there were some people doing it, but very few. And I think this year people are going back to doing it. And, um, yeah, so no, I just, uh, I'll sit, sit out with a box of candy and, and hand it out until it's gone. And then once the box is gone, uh, that's it. I shut out the lights and, and go do whatever people, people are only out till about, I don't know, from six o'clock till eight o'clock, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, the little kids. And then the rest is just often older teens trying to get the leftovers or miscreants smashing pumpkins or what have <laughs> you. It is trick or treat. So the it, it is the the trick is usually just stealing your pumpkin and smashing it in front of your head, <laughs> or, or papering your house, or setting something yeah. on fire. Or, and it depends on uh, how 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 you want to turn the volume up. Uh, what does it look like in Scandinavia trick or treating, Philip? Do you have are you going to have trick or treaters at your door? Do you think? Maybe like in the last few years, I, I've I feel like it's less of that than when I was a kid. It might be the fact that we live in apartment buildings. Mm. Um, and when I was a kid, at least where I lived, there usually weren't locks on the doors to the buildings. And so the kids could just come in and, and knock on our door. Whereas today, there's always like a code and you're going to have a, you know, a key to get in. So uh, it's, if anything, it's going to be the kids in, in the same apartment mm. building where I live. 
Um, and I, I don't know, I, it's been a while since I went trick or treating and I don't have kids of my own, but it's, it's, it's the standard thing, I guess it's kids dress up. They, they come to your door, they ask for candy. There's never any, there's not much tricking in my experience here. It's just, they come and they ask for candy and you give them candy and then, and then they leave. Uh, regardless if you give them candy or not, they're, they're just gonna, they're just gonna go away sad. Yeah. Um, we, we only did tricking if the, the people that handed out one of two things, one, if you handed out anything dental hygiene related, you got a trick. Uh, so anyone who handed out like toothpaste or toothbrushes, those, those people are, they get in trouble. And also anyone who, if you handed someone a religious tract, that was the, that was, that turned on the nuclear option for us as kids. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I mean, we, we brought like ammunition, like it really was like the trick or treat that the, the trick part was a threat, a legitimate threat as <laughs> I remember being like, we were terrible children. And if you put like a, like a tract, like, do you know, you're going to hell for this? like all right well yeah i don't know if i'm going to hell or not but you're definitely cleaning toilet paper out of your trees for the next week um so i don't know we were much more aggressive when i was kids in terms of uh the trick part really was like a a, a real threat i think it's another thing these the kids have got soft you know yeah. just, uh, <laughs> it's gotten soft these uh, they'll so, wind up on youtube <laughs> yeah god forbid um so what, a, what, what if just, Justin about how do you accomplish Halloween? I think, yeah, this is, I think an interesting question. It's just a vibe, right? It's, it's like, it's like a mystical ineffable knowledge, right? It's a, the leaves are yellow on the trees and on the ground and you've maybe decorated your house and you're, you've watched horror movies and you're in, like, it's a mood and you, you just know like Halloween, it's Halloween. Uh, Grasping the ineffable. That's how you. <laughs> Wow, it's gonna be really he gets really uh, <laughs> dio, like pseudo Dionysian. Um, this yeah. is what happens when you do Halloween with philosophers. You see, oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about how hilarious it would be if I tried trick or treating, like in one of the very religious neighborhoods here in Jerusalem, like over the tracks, like in Mea Sharim, where like it's <laughs> hardcore Haredi, like Yiddish speaking, like people don't even know what trick like Halloween is, like to show up in in full regalia and. And go door knocking that would be absolutely hilarious but like i remember like there, yeah you could get wow, yeah <laughs> you know like i i that would be actually make a very funny like prank <laughs> or like a like a vlog to do but i remember i grew up in sydney uh which is very you know australia which is a very christian country um and i remember that we would always have candy to give out because although there is a biblical prohibition um that orthodox jews keep in practice about not not imitating or copying the customs of the non-Jews. So Leviticus 18.3 of Bechuk Seim Leselech of not, God took us out of Egypt and took us to the land of Canaan and we're not supposed to do like the Canaanites. And that's read in every single successive diaspora that we're not supposed to do uh, like the religions of our neighbors. But um, certainly like if a, if, a, if a child came or kids came uh, with good enough costumes, we would have candies to give out. And I think there is some sort of there's a beautiful way to both respect one's own integrity and religion and not just simply turn everything into a chrismica and to 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 assimilate although for people that do that and, and find it meaningful all the power to them but definitely for those that want to hold on to you know their specific traditions and 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 very much not uh do like the people around them um but to still find a way to to be friendly and to to be able to welcome people in and to make them feel comfortable and accepted uh and there's certainly a jewish value there of of promoting the ways of peace darkei shalom and so i think for all of my jewish friends out there while while they may not feel comfortable partaking it themselves they should definitely you know have some candies ready for those that do find it fun or meaningful for for themselves yeah that's been always the halakhic argument i've seen for being able to do it is it's not religious it's not avodah zara it's just darkei shalom like so yeah at any rate complicated legal stuff yeah but at what point does it leave the orbit of religion exactly that's what i'm saying is that it's not <laughs> i would say that it's that it, it that it can be celebrated as religious but it can also be observed as a as a completely secular in the same way that i would like you know again like the, the funny thing about thinking about how do you celebrate the fourth of july or something in america um you have to explode at least you know, one pound of uh, <laughs> of explosives to have accomplished the 4th of July. But I don't know. I, I want to push back against uh, Philip and be like, I don't know. I, when If Halloween's just a mood, it seems like one has one has the ability and maybe the obligation to 
properly facilitate that mood, both for oneself and for uh, the larger Halloween observant society. And therefore, mm -hmm. like, um, because the mood won't happen by accident. I mean, obviously the leaves changing colors and things like that, that, that certainly facilitates and nature helps to cooperate with that. But I don't know. It seems like that, I don't know if I were to somehow have gone all the way through Halloween and not watched at least a scary movie or not watched or not, like not uh, walk, taken a walk through a graveyard or not uh, done something, some amount of, or literally have a live stream talking about Halloween on Halloween, the most meta Halloween thing ever. Uh, I feel like I would have failed to have properly accomplished my, my Halloween duties. Um, Anyone else feel that way? Or am I, am I alone in this? Am I being too legalistic about my Very Halloween? Very legalistic. Ha my, this is my your mind at work. Yeah, this is my halachic <laughs> mind. I'm, I'm, I'm a Salavechik, uh, <laughs> uh, Salavechikian uh, uh, thinking of, of, of how, do, how do I have accomplished it. But You're doing, Justin, you're doing Salloween like us Jews do Pesach. You're just speaking about the festival. Is this... <laughs> I lost Zevi. Spooky. Uh oh. He's went into the void. The Haredi <laughs> people got him. Oh no, um, time trap. It happened. But am I am I am I really alone in this, Dan? No, I mean, on a personal level, I, uh, the movies are really important. Just okay. As you watched at least, well, I used to have a tradition where I would try to watch thirty-one scary 31. movies. Thirty-one. In the month of October, so basically one movie a day. Okay. I, that was when I was a teenager. That's not really possible now. So, but I tried to just watch. I tried to condense all my horror movie watching to this month. Uh, so if a, a scary movie came out back in May, I will have sort of waited, and I'll watch it now, for example, just to get into the mood. And especially Delayed gratification. On, yeah, and especially today, like on October thirty first, we'll gather like me and my wife and my younger brother is here for example and we'll just sit around and watch movies all night basically that's that's the most important aspect of halloween on a personal level i do the same where i try to compress everything that's spooky and scary into that month and give myself the month but i'm, I'm like that where like all of october is halloween and yeah, right. and then starting november I, i'm one of those cursed people who starts christmas like oh, no. very early <laughs> uh and the reason is uh, it's because it gets so dark here it's true there's no light like and it's dismal so these are our light festivals where you where you string lights up everywhere and have all kinds of different lights and i think that that alone is um part of the vibe so i would say i don't i don't think of it as you know performing halloween mitzvot or anything like that but but I do think of it as setting up the vibe because it makes the dark of winter tolerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, Christmas and Halloween, putting up the lights and then, you know, taking down the lights and then putting up the other lights, that's the, the ritual. And it's, it's more of an illumination thing than anything. Yeah, that also highlights another psychological effect of Halloween or Samhain. Um, you know, when you say that uh, you get into the mood of watching horror movies or spooky stuff, in a way, it's also um, uh, a way to get in touch with our fears. And because it's, you know, you normally we have those so-called negative feelings that we try to control and we try to sort of avoid or you know just keep them away whereas uh, during this season it feels like you're allowed and even encouraged to uh, get acquainted with those feelings and so maybe that's another accomplishment of halloween uh, that it allows us to get acquainted with that fearful side of us with the dark side of us in um, many different ways even from a psychological point of view you know it's like okay it is safe now to engage with this thing that will make me feel scared and spooky and uh, but it is a time when it is allowed and it is encouraged so you feel safe enough to explore something that would otherwise be scary you know, like traumatically scary. Instead, it becomes fun scary. Is there any examples of that? Is there any things like that, Angela, that for you, you have to have accomplished, like having watched, I don't know, not 31 scary movies. That's very impressive. <laughs> uh, that would be, uh, be the, that would be a real marathon. But is there 
it, it, would, it, would there be something that, I don't know, if you didn't, like I have to make sure on the way home from my lecture today, I get a pumpkin to make a jack-o'-lantern because without a jack-o'-lantern, right? It's it's like a, you know, it's like, it's like the S rogue, uh, the S rogue of Halloween. You can't you can't do Halloween without a, a jack-o'-lantern. I don't know, uh, and it's also fun to, for me to carve with my kids. And even before I had kids, I still did it. But there's like a I I, I would have failed at Halloween had I not carved at least a jack-o'-lantern. Is there anything like that for? For you, Angela, that you feel like you. I still, I still find it funny that you talk about failing at Halloween. But anyway, to answer <laughs> your question, <laughs> um, I think it, it really depends. I tend to do something slightly different every year, but um, some things actually recur over the years. Last year, I was in a cemetery. <laughs> I know this sounds very goth, but uh, <laughs> it probably is. But yeah, last year I was in a in a cemetery and I was kind of contemplating death, you know, the memento mori kind of thing. <laughs> um, what I did, what I did this last weekend with my kids. Yeah, yeah, you you mentioned that, uh, mm -hmm. but I also like you know to light up candles and to do some of the you know engage with some of the traditions that have to do with ancestors and uh, getting in touch with ancestors and. Um, yeah and other interesting pagan things yeah i'd like i'm gonna i don't know i'm gonna like look into a mirror and see if i can't see the powerball numbers have folks seen it's like a billion dollars <laughs> i have a black mirror <laughs> like i do too I, I have an obsidian one and i should just like yeah. obsidian know, one that is um shaped like this i can't remember the english term but um it's not flat it's like this. Con it was yeah yeah mine's uh i don't know mine's just like a random piece of obsidian i found it I is <laughs> it's really interesting to reflect us in this way that we think of festivals that angela's saying that it's funny how you're thinking in terms of like what you need to do in order to have fulfilled the festival and uh, to me that's a totally natural way of thinking about a festival like while i don't have much of a cultural relationship a direct cultural relationship with with halloween these questions of how does one go about making sure that they uh that they ch checked off the checklist so that that festival like was accomplished is a totally natural way of thinking. And it's, it's, it's perhaps interesting to contrast um, that very way that we that are approaching the, the festivities. No, I'm just, yeah, I'm probably just wrong. I mean, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking one, I'm taking one religious cultural system and trying to view a completely other one through it. Uh, which can result in hilarious conversations, but are probably uh, methodologically a, a completely a mess. So is there like a supernal Halloween world where you affect change in the supernal <laughs> world through your pumpkin carvings and so forth? Yeah, you have to, you, it, it, the pumpkin has to, it's, it, it, uh, it, it, it affects the, the true, the great pumpkin. It the is, pumpkin uh, below affects yeah, the pumpkin. It's, it's a, one has to imitate the form of pumpkin. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's participating in it uh, in the form of the ideal form of pumpkin. <laughs> Platonic observance of Halloween. So are there anything that you guys hate about Halloween um, uh, or things that you recall from your childhood that you hated? I personally, when I would go trick-or-treating and people would be like, you would say trick-or-treat and they'd be like, okay, give me a trick or something. And, and you, it was like they wanted payment for the candy. <laughs> <laughs> Get to like tap I, I, dance or something. I was always like, "What is wrong with you? <laughs> Just give me the candy and let me go on." <laughs> I mean, Maybe I could say the nothing. the most easy stereotypical thing is that there's a part of me that like I love the fact that it has become so widely available, but also like the commercialization of it. There's something about that that's obviously cuts in a way that I think most people can agree is like not that great. Like the you know how capitalism kind of ruins things and some ways. Say again. Commodify. Commodify. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah the, the commodification of um, of Halloween, that's not so great. Yeah, the, um, the sheer amount of, of trash that's bought for one day use and then thrown into landfills the next day is definitely not, <laughs> not a great part of any festival. Right. Yeah, but that's not specific to Halloween. It's for not, every yeah. festivity. Right. For me, I think I kind of appreciate it because I just moved to a new place, and I think there's no better time to move, you know, to <laughs> to move and decorate your house than <laughs> this time of the year. But uh, yeah, I I agree that um, there's too much of a commodification 
uh, but that happens with every festivity i think it's not peculiar to halloween i have noticed the chocolate ration diminishing year by year <laughs> and just the chocolate itself is now disgusting like it is just this palm oil simulated chocolate stuff and we used to get actual chocolate bars and they would be fairly big but every year the gram count just shrank and shrank and the price went up and shrinkflation and then the content would just become absolutely nasty uh, i have noticed that and i wonder you know little kids doing that today will not remember fondly of the delicious candy they ate they'll just think of all the horrible crap that they got from the mars or snickers factory interesting i feel like i've noticed that candy getting better my kids bring home way better candy than i ever got which was like the whatever that orange gelatinous stuff wrapped in oh the, yeah yeah wax paper or whatever um the candy corn yeah candy corn um but yeah any other things that people dislike about halloween orange toffee those toffees that they gave out yeah those are the ones i'm thinking of those people who give that out i think they hate children <laughs> i don't like candy that much <laughs> i love chocolate it's too so. sweet nothing is too sweet <laughs> what's the connection between apple bobbing and toffee apples and halloween is there some sort of apple halloween connection a harvest and the time right. of year that apples come in like apple bobbing is gross just yeah <laughs> it is nasty uh yeah. caramel apples are awesome <laughs> right you just but uh, those you can get basically if you go to any farm they have the the red candy dip and they have the caramel candy apples and i think you can get that pretty much all year round but apple bobbing was definitely something that people associated with halloween and I'm sure nobody is doing that now. <laughs> in, in the bogey books, uh, it's always a boy and a girl doing it at the same time. Again, it's like, uh, at least in the in the bogey books I've read. So it's one of those examples of, uh, of again, like a, facilitating boys and girls or adolescent boys and girls being able to, you know, you know, all the heteronormative stuff there, but basically, you know, encouraging them to be in proximity with their face in water somehow. I don't know. Um, although so, I will say that when we did it growing up, we had it... Uh, they would put dry ice in the water and so it would like be all smoky and spooky and they put the color of the water green and so it looked like kind of a cauldron or whatever burn your know. tongue yeah you, you can only put so much in to to do that but um i don't know yeah that was a lot of fun i thought mm. yeah dan are you in in canada yes are yeah, you canadian in, yes in southern ontario oh i didn't know that yeah, it's funny that Dan and I are relatively close, all things told, despite the fact there's an international border between us. Yeah, we, we live basically a three-hour drive apart, which is pretty nice. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious in that way, uh, considering how otherwise it's like 5,000 miles away from everyone else. Yeah. We're pretty Have you met in person? Not yet. Uh, no, it's like we're... Uh, the, the border, I mean, I don't know about you, Dan, but the... At least with the COVID stuff being less restricted, but man, the border was like slammed shut. There was no way across it. Yeah, uh, they freak me out too. They can dismantle your car and or on a whim what? and force you to pay to put it back together, and uh, lots of risks when you cross the border, which yeah, is the very unfortunate because it makes me a lot more hesitant to do it. I still do it for academic conferences and things like that when you're like i'm gonna be at this address and i'm going to be doing this and then they look at you funny and they're like a medieval conference you don't have any axes or maces do you and then i'm like no dude it's not that kind of conference and they're like are you sure <laughs> no people like uh, every time i cross the border they're always like are you bringing any weapons into canada and i'm like no they're like are you bringing like do you have any of the following six things and it's always this long list of like like medieval weapons, even they're like, do you have any replica weapons you're bringing yeah. to Canada? I'm like, <laughs> why are they obsessed with that? I, I hate when people are joking at, with you when they're the people who have the power to rip apart your car and right. do all this and that. It's like, haha, funny. <laughs> it's, because it, through. it's because America is awash in weaponry. Yes. And Canada is sane <sighs> and do not want that doesn't want their country awash in weaponry. And so they, you know, and there's a huge trade of like, criminal gangs and organized crime in Toronto. Um, there's a huge market of smuggling weaponry from, totally. from the United States into, yeah, well, a, a non-fun Halloween topic. Um, 
but talking about crossing borders, I mean, that is a very Halloween topic, right? Yes. But the border here is just instead of geographic, it's between the living and the dead, let's say. I'm curious, I'm curious to know what, what are the rituals that, um, if there are any today, that are still uh, mimicking, replicating that journey um, from the living to the, to the deceased, to the, to the afterworld? What do you mean? Are there other practices, um, either from Samhain or from Halloween, where one sort of can traverse? I know there's sort of this divinization or communication with the with the afterworld, or or sort of this intercession with with the, with the souls. But is there any kind of journey that one undertakes um, symbolically or ritualistically to to cross over? I guess I mean dressing up in some sense in like a skeleton or like a ghost itself is some sort of enactment of that. But I'm wondering if there are any more crossing of the liminal space instead of just um taking uh heroic doses of psychedelics perhaps <laughs> but it's not exactly a, a state sanctioned holiday <laughs> but among that's about the closest that you can get among pagans and magic practitioners yeah you have those kind of things uh so um both symbolically and you know ritualistically um so for instance the one thing that is very common uh, when it comes to celebrating Samhain, especially in public pagan rituals, is to enact in a symbolic way what is happening in the season. And it is done kind of according to a methodology that has been laid out by the Wiccan religion. So you have this duodeistic view of the goddess and the god and how they alternate. They are like the female principle and the male principle. And um, during this time of the year, one thing that is enacted is the um, death, the dying of the god that will be reborn on the winter solstice. And so one thing that I saw in pagan rituals in, in Italy was that the goddess was you know, um, impersonated, channeled by the priestess and the god by the priest. And there was this very ritualistic thing using a, um, a pomegranate that is often associated with this season as well. And the goddess would uh, sort of symbolically stab the god to kill him so that he would go into the underworld and then get reborn from her womb. And so, um, yeah, that was kind of a symbolic representation of that. But you also have rituals where people try to contact the dead, whether in terms of spiritualism kind of setting, or you have uh, people doing regression rituals to remember their past lives. So, yeah, there are many actually <laughs> rituals of that sort, uh, you know, that. Um, symbolically or ritualistically so we could say for real but you know the, the term i don't particularly like the term real just because it's difficult to define and it, it you know different people depending on their belief system will have a different definition of what real is but it is just you know to understand each other as an operative term so some people yeah will do rituals that have to do with contacting the other side in one way or another or even symbolically i think that in both cases it is a way of getting in touch with that other side i think a ritual i don't know if you would call it a ritual but definitely some societal pattern that you see a lot around halloween time there's two of them one is uh the corn maze mm -hmm which we see a lot of where people build these elaborate mazes in cornfields and you go and you get lost in the corn maze. And the other one is a variation of this that is perhaps more relevant. And that is the haunted house mm -hmm. uh, where people decorate their houses like a nightmare house that you would never, ever want to live in normally. And you go and you get, you know, grab, I guess they can't grab people anymore, but people dressed in costumes hide in nooks and crannies and try to scare you. And I think that is perhaps like a simulation of death or the demonic or a simulation of, you know, being lost in an underworld where you, you don't want to be around those things, but obviously people choose to do those things and they don't really have that sacred, uh, catabasis kind of feel of going into a cave and letting serpents crawl over your body and uh, finding yourself they're, they're more for fun and and just getting freaked out but i think that 
that is probably the closest analog that you might get in the culture at large to exploring these themes in a hands-on ritual way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's another association I have very strongly with both Halloween and Christmas Eve, which is a another question I was going to ask is sort of when do people think spooky season ends? Does it end on, you know, uh, when does it end? And for me, it very much ends on Christmas Eve. And I think about this time period of today to like, you know, this first period was sort of the lead up to the beginning of spooky season and really spooky season in some sense begins now and goes later. Um, and the ghost is the, is the, is the sort of, uh, entity that I most strongly associate with this time period. Um, much more so than I guess the witch, which is interesting because I guess that has something to do with my own psychology and having studied medieval witchcraft. It's like that, that, that image is not that, um, not as powerful for me, but the entity of the ghost, I think is to me, the quintessential entity of this time period, because in the vampire too, right. The, the, because they're both examples of entities that are somehow here and not, um, and that again, this goes back to our earlier conversation about liminality, um, mm-hmm. where demons are clearly just not, they're like clearly bad. They're just, they're on team bad. You, there's no, you know, demonic entities. You're like, you kind of know what to do with them. They're not liminal in the least bit. Um, and so, but it ghosts, I think, um, and vampires are, I think are creatures that are, are entities that I think are the most, I don't know, speak most powerfully to me. In fact, the, the, the type of scary movies that I tend to want to watch this time of year would not be ones with like, I don't know, Cenobites to speak to Dan's tastes, um, would, would not be sort of demonically informed things. It would be ghost informed things. Um, and speaking of which the, the, uh, the new interview with the vampire is like really, really great. Uh, folks have been watching it at all on AMC, but yeah, it's interesting sort of the, what kind of entities like haunted house movies. I, uh, I started rereading leaves of, uh, uh, not leaves of grass, uh, house of leaves. And, uh, you know, some of the books out stories I was reading were ghost stories. And so it's so interesting. The witch gets featured so prominently, uh, I think, but I guess for me, the ghost and the vampire to me are the, the creatures I most associate with, with, with Halloween precisely because of that liminality. I'm the exact same way. It's all about ghosts and vampires in particular. Speaking of which. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh Uh, I was just thinking in, in the States you have, um, Oh, very nice. Oh, wow. Like live stream dinner. My wife just came in with this, I don't know, a sandwich. (laughs) Philip, you have an amazing partner. I mean, just uh, uh, just, just so she 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 knows that. Hi. Uh, the, the power behind the throne. Uh, Definitely. That really, the that's uh, yeah, wonderful. But, oh, yeah. So I was saying, in in the states, you have uh, Thanksgiving, right? Uh, between Christmas and Halloween, right? Yeah, you guys. And that kind of helps ease the transition from one season to the next. But in Canada, our Halloween, or rather our Thanksgiving, is in October. Right. Um, it's it's more like synced up with the harvests, I guess, and the idea of harvest abundance. Um, whereas I think in by when when is Thanksgiving in the states? Like mid November, late November. Late November, the twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Like that's so close to Christmas for me. It's already Christmas season by that point because we don't we don't have that same liminal holiday where we get together with the family and it punctuates the difference between the two. Well, you get started on Christmas November first, so it's like your your game on. It's true for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, any other like creatures that jump out to you? Uh, Angela or Zevi for this time the of year? Puka. That, the Puka, of course. Um, I, it was funny because the other day I just popped up on my uh, YouTube feeds, you know, um, um, a video that said, is the Puka Festival cultural appropriation? I'm like, yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is my life. This is not a, co- this is not a costume. <laughs> Yeah, because apparently one of the um, names for uh, Samhain was Puka Festival, and is Puka Festival, actually. Mm. Uh, Something that I discovered in recent years. Uh, But yeah, funny. (laughs) I'm sure that you are doing it, but yeah, uh, milking that for all it's worth. Um, I'm glad that you you really can uh, ride that wave. 
Is that, yeah. do, do you yeah. ever get like? I mean, we have a couple of like spooky Jewish stuff, Dibiks and Maziks and Ruchot and all. Is that is that ever a thing that like you think about more this time of year, or is it just sort of like? <laughs> like I, I mean, mean, we have we definitely have those spooky stuff. Um, I, I think you've covered a bunch of them over at the channel. The you know the Dibuks and the the Golems and the um, the Asmodeus, the Ashmedai. I, I love that stuff as a kid. Yeah. I don't know if I. Um, particularly associate that with this time of the year, just because because it's not it's not like a for me it's not a my my native culture's Judaism and and therefore it's not an association which is made this time of year. Um, I think maybe maybe in general, like in the winter when things are a bit darker and drearier and the the nights are longer, those are the kinds of stories that are being told around the campfires. Um, so maybe there's some sort of connection there, but I don't think it's particularly, uh, yeah, I just, I just don't, we, we were discussing how there isn't really like a festival in Judaism that's really making uh, a deal of those. And even when we are like associating with, you know, the deceased, uh, it's not done in a spooky way. Like I think the closest, the, po the closest correlative would be the Yiskar prayer mm -hmm. where we're praying for the souls of the, of the deceased. Um, and it's definitely solemn. And it's, it's, um, but, but I don't think it's spooky and it's not, it's also not being done. It's not being connected with, uh, the, the spooky characters in Judaism. I don't know if they have any time of the year, which is unfortunate. I really do think there needs to be a Jewish Halloween where we take our, the Jewish spooky characters and we make some, some Jewish rituals around them. I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've thought a lot about how to, you know, go to ritual well and, um, Yom HaMesim or something. I don't know, like how we would, how we would make it happen, but, uh. I'm sure we could, but yeah, it's just funny that it's, it's interesting what religions have access to these kinds of technologies and which ones don't for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, Philip, I've heard also that the way that Islam is practiced in Egypt, there's a bit more of an inheritance of sort of interaction with the dead in, in, in Egyptian Islam, that maybe a cultural hangover from earlier time periods. And I've heard this is also true of Coptic Christianity that that the Muslims and Muslims in the Egyptian context interact with the dead in a much more hands-on kind of way than perhaps the rest of the Muslim world. Is that, is that true? Is that a... I think so. Yeah. I've, I've come across that idea as well. And, and, you know, I just did a, a video on the Shams al-Ma'arif yesterday, uh, attributed to Ahmed al-Buni and that is very much also connected to Egypt. He is said to have lived in Egypt and, and, you know, um, alchemy, a lot of that sort of occult stuff, uh, is often traced to to Egypt and as being sort of a, a continuous tradition from from pre-Islamic times, uh, particularly in Egypt. So there, yeah, there's definitely that that connection. I don't know how how strong that is, but it's definitely something that I, that I've come across too. Yeah, it's another interesting situation analogous to the European situation, where uh, an earlier strata of paganism can survive in into a monotheistic Abrahamic religion, less as a religious practice, but more as a cultural way of being. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I, I find that, you know, that's just the same with Irish, you know, Irish Christianity, how Samhain survived in it, um, in this sort of embryonic way, only to be really unpacked really in the late 19th century in terms of Halloween uh, here. Which I also would say, right? Like one of the things we're, I guess, not talking about that much is actual Christian celebrations at this time of the year with All Saints Day and uh, All Souls Day and 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 things like that. And you know, the Day of the Dead for especially for folks in in, in Mexico and um, those kinds of you know observations which are deeply Catholic. And um, but yeah, I don't know. It's another aspect of this whole time period that um, that could go could go uh, discussed, but. Um, yeah, yeah. People are wondering in the comments about various Jewish monsters. Um, yeah, I need to do like a whole episode and just run down the list of all of them, and because um, there's a lot more than golems. Did you guys see that Dibbic movie that came out? Was it like two years ago? Which I, one? I forget what it's called? Is it the Vigil? Is that the one? No, the Vigil. Yeah, but that wasn't a Dibbic though. That was a Mazik. Uh -huh. I know this is like splitting hairs. He needs a monster manual. Yeah, you got to get a monster manual. Uh, him, him, shade him, you have the whole, the whole yeah. thing. So <laughs> Dibbics are spirits of evil dead people. They're not, but a Mazik is a specific type of Talmudic demon. 
Uh, although they make it more scary in that movie. I don't know how, Zevi, how you were raised, but Mazikin are always thought of to me as like kind of like they're ink, like poltergeists. So they're inconvenient, but they're not like they're like imps, kind of. They like bother some little creatures that, but in the movie, they were really scary. Um, yeah, they're not seen as all that pow- like powerful or, or dangerous or pernicious. They'll, they'll like, they'll mess around and you're supposed to not go into like an abandoned building yourself or else they may, you know, throw some things in you but but it's not but it's not all that powerful what what is interesting is the degree to which those um otherwise unseen entities are are so present uh in in the in the everyday world like there's there the boundary that we have between uh of many people have in the modern period between the natural world and the supernatural um it seems to be much more blurred and those supernatural occurrences are just almost taken for granted uh, similar right. to what angela was saying before about the perception of the real, those things are, are seen as, as real and they're just seen as part of everyone. Like your daily planning and journeying is is taken into account whether you're going to be harassed by a mazik or not. Like it seems to be an interesting point, which is true, I think, for many of the um, traditional societies that, that we're studying here and discussing. Yeah. And this, I think, maybe this goes back to Dan's point earlier, thinking about why Judaism doesn't have a, a holiday like Halloween. And it goes back to the point you made earlier, Dan. It's like if you're experiencing bad stuff all the time, you wouldn't have a specific holiday set aside to like deal with your traumatic fear and anxiety. It's just like, that's just Judaism. It's just like, here's how you remember all the bad things that have happened to you four times a year. And uh, there's no escape. There's no like release valve. Cause it's just the whole religion is the release valve. Uh, that's a, a pessimistic way of painting it, but I could. Um, yeah. I mean, there's also suddenly theological ways in which Jewish suffering and tragedy is taken up and put into you know, the, 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 the national drama or, or the divine drama by the Kabbalists. And in that way, it's, it's, you know, taken, there's a sort of power taken back. It's not just something that we've been subjected to, but we're, we're going to see the exile of the Jew as the exile of the Shechina, of the divine feminine throughout time. And um, these ways where, where we, we, we take, we, we take control of the narrative by, by putting our own spin on it and by seeing it as part of the divine drama. And, and maybe that's different than, making a, a celebration out of it. Maybe that's a particularly Jewish way of dealing with it, with, the, with you know, the shittiness of, of the world around us. Sublimation. Yeah, sublimation. Yeah. That's the that's the sublimation or transference of one of those techniques. Well, folks, I have to get ready to go uh, teach on a completely non-Halloween related topic of, of uh, well, I guess it's kind of somewhat. I'm teaching on, uh, on uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, whose uh, famous daughter, of course, is... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mary Shelley. Uh, who, if you ever want to feel bad about yourself, just remind yourself that she wrote that at like 18 and then you will feel like, Oh yeah. What did I accomplish by 18? Um, uh, so that's the way I, you know, sometimes I, that's why I don't study uh, Isaac Newton. Cause I don't want to think about the fact that he did all that stuff in like one year. Like what did you do in the pandemic? I don't know. Invent calculus, discover the fundamental light nature of light and gravitation. How about you start a YouTube channel? Um, but uh, anyway, I have to go and teach. But last thoughts, Halloween wise, uh, last um, until next year, we get to do this again. And sort of any other uh, Halloween well wishes or Samhain well wishes or any other last. Uh, yeah, I'd say I say a blessed Samhain or Belsane for those who are the other five. In the <laughs> of upside the, down. Yeah, in the upside down, <laughs> the other <laughs> hemisphere. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I hope that everybody is enjoying the thinning of the veil in whatever way they feel comfortable and allows them to experience that liminality. Don't eat too much palm oil. <laughs> <laughs> just just yeah. don't do it. It'll have spooky consequences. Yeah, for whoever's celebrating, it should be done. It should be fun. It should be meaningful. It should be safe. And um, yeah, that's... Happy Halloween, everyone, or a happy Samhain, however <laughs> you are celebrating. Yeah, well, ditto, I'm gonna echo that sentiment. Um, yeah, I hope everyone has a, a, a happy, safe, liminal, transgressive, uh, wear as many clothes as you like or as little clothes as you need in order to facilitate your your, Hall- your Halloween experience. Uh, good luck being up all night, Philip, with your scary movies i uh, hope that they treat you well and they are positively scary but every uh but i just want to say um thank you guys for taking the time with me to hang out on a halloween afternoon morning 
Um, Thanks for inviting us. Of course. Thank you for us. This is just absolutely wonderful. I just love you guys so much. Uh, and again, you. just uh, thank you for everyone else who's like been watching. It's like 400 plus people watching. So um, just really appreciate everyone watching and hope everyone has just the best Halloween. Uh, I feel like for also this the pandemic's winding down a little bit in some ways so we can do this again. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say to everyone, you know, really enjoy it. And I think most of us knew what we missed during the time period of the worst of the lockdowns and stuff. So for folks who are able to get out and enjoy the the night out tonight, I really hope that you have absolutely the, the best, spookiest and uh, most fun uh, Halloween. And again, also for folks who are, this is a profound religious experience and a religious holiday. I also want to uh, wish you a very numinous um, experience in the thinning of the veil. So, all right, everybody. Well, uh, see y'all in a little while. Thank you so much again. And, uh, Happy Halloween.